turn to the book of Jude at the end of the New Testament. And look at the third verse of this book. Jude says, Beloved, while I was giving all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation, I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Jude says you are exhorted to contend for the faith, that faith which has historical definition, once and for all delivered to the saints. That's your obligation. God expects it of you. You know, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, perhaps the best-known verse on apologetics in the New Testament, the best-known verse dealing with the defense of the Christian faith, Peter says, But set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, being ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason concerning the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. Peter lays this down as a command, just as clearly as the command that you should not murder or commit adultery, just as surely as the command that you should worship God, so we find the command here that you should be prepared, be ready to answer anybody who asks a reason for the hope that is in you. I want to stress the fact that it's at any point and any man that you are to be prepared to answer, prepared to answer. You're not supposed to be in a situation where you simply say, oh, I have to go run and ask somebody else about that, or let me check my books. I think I remember reading something on that. There is something about the defense of the faith that makes it possible for everybody who is a believer to deal with any believer at any time. And if I can, in some small measure during this conference, get that approach to defending the faith across to you, then we really will have accomplished something. Because then I will have put a real weapon in your hand for defending the faith, even if you haven't read as much as your university professor or even your roommate on some subject. Because you will know what it takes to establish any point of view over against that of the Bible. And you'll know that the unbeliever cannot do that. The key to having an ability to answer anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, the key to being able to confront any challenge to your Christian faith is found in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. In this text, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the weapons that we use are not the weapons of the world, are not fleshly or physical weapons. Obviously, we're not going to win a debate with the professor or with the roommate by taking out a gun and shooting them. That's not the Christian approach to defending the faith. You said something I don't like, so wipe you out. Or as Arnold puts it, hasta la vista, baby. That's the end for you. Say, some of you have seen the movie. I knew that you had done that. Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, and yet they are mighty before God for the casting down of strongholds. And then in verse 5, he defines more exactly what this casting down of strongholds amounts to. He says, casting down reasonings. That's actually the Greek word, reasonings. Casting down reasonings and every high thing exalted against the knowledge of God. Everything, every form of reasoning that is exalted against the knowledge of God that lifts itself up in human pride and arrogance to attack the truthfulness of God, every reasoning exalted against the knowledge of God, you can cast down, not with fleshly weapons, he says, but rather, and here's the key, he says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The way in which you will equip yourself to be a defender of the faith, even though you haven't been able to do all the research on some subject, is that you're going to learn first to bring every one of your own thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. You're going to learn to think as a Christian should think. And I hope by the time I 
finish, Lord willing, on Monday my presentations, you'll have a much better idea of what that means, to think as a Christian. The Christian does not have any area of his or her life that is surrendered to neutrality. The Christian doesn't have any area of his reasoning or her reasoning that is not related somehow to the prerogatives and the claims of Jesus Christ. God calls on us to glorify Him in everything that we do. In fact, even our eating and drinking. Whatever you do, Paul says, do it to the glory of God. Jesus tells us we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Our minds are to be used in obedience to God and as an expression of love to God. By the way, that's something you should think about. This is just an aside, but I hope it's a worthwhile one. That's something you should think about when, a little bit after midterm in the semester, you finally get so tired of doing homework and so bored that you just think you can start cutting a few corners and just get by. You remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you to love Him with your mind. Now, you know that if the Lord Jesus asked you to love Him by praying or by evangelizing, or leading a holy life, or having conduct that is obedient before Him. That makes perfectly good sense to you. You don't always do it, but you know you're wrong when you don't. But you know what bothers me? Christians often don't see how disobedient they are in the way that they think. They are intellectually lazy. They are intellectually disloyal to the Lord without even knowing it in many cases. Jesus says that we should pay attention to our minds and use our minds to love Him and glorify Him in all that we do. So the ability to pull down all antagonistic reasoning that you find in college or anywhere in the world is going to be gained when you start thinking consistently principially and without any wavering as a Christian. Thinking God's thoughts after him about everything, whether it be the most recent football game or the most sophisticated theory in physics. Thinking God's thoughts after him. Learning to regiment your thinking so that what God has revealed in his word becomes foundational presuppositional for you in all that you do. Well, if you learn to think as a Christian in this way, if you bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, as Paul clearly tells you to do, you probably right now are realizing there are people who are going to tell you, well, the way that's prejudicial. You can't do that. You can't, in a conversation between opposing parties, in a debate between hostile points of view, you can't just take for granted that Christianity is right. You can't have all of your thoughts brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Obviously, when it comes to a consideration of conflicting viewpoints, at that point, you've got to become neutral. And you're going to hear, I mean, you're going to hear that without even hearing it. By which I mean, without people saying that, they're going to constantly be pressing that upon you in college. You must be neutral. You must not take your Christianity for granted. You must examine everything by standards that are common to all men and more objective than simply your religious commitment. And so we need to take a few moments here to talk about neutrality. And I have two simple messages about neutrality. You'll be able to remember them easily, but if you're taking notes, they go like this. When the university professor or the unbeliever that you're dealing with wants you to be neutral, two things. Remember, one, they aren't, and two, you shouldn't be. You remember that? They aren't, and you shouldn't be. The first point is those very people who will tell you that Christians have no right to take for granted their point of view are not practicing neutrality themselves. They are not neutral when they approach their subject matter. Now, what will bother you, of course, is that they will always tell you that they are. 